In November 2011, a family of five moved into what they hoped would be their forever home. But less than a week after moving in, they started to experience unsettling events. This home quickly became a horrific nightmare, resulting in multiple exorcisms at the house. Today, we continue our themed month of haunted houses as we take a closer look at the demon house of Gary, Indiana. This is Red Web. What is up, Task Force? It is another Mystery Monday, back with Red Web, the podcast all about the unknown. Mysteries, unsolved, true crime cryptids, and this month, haunted houses. I'm Trevor Collins, with me as always, reacting for the very first time, Alfredo Diaz. Alfredo, have you heard about the demon house of Gary, Indiana? Um, like 99% of the topics? No. <laughs> that being said, uh -huh. I'm expecting... A high bar here. I'm Ooh, expecting a lot. Okay. I mean, we have done over 100 episodes. Right. I'm sure in our Red Web career, we'll probably do hundreds. This is called the Demon House. This is the Demon House. Like, demon is a very common term mm -hmm. in, like, all these, like, paranormal, occult, that type of stuff. So to call this the Demon House. Right. I feel like it's got a bring it it's heavy right like yeah. it, it feels like you are pinnacle haunted house action right with a name like that well that's a great segue because i want to dive into almost a disclaimer at the top of this okay uh, a lot of the information we're going to discuss is alleged this is a very interesting case and i'm so happy we're talking about it because i watched the documentary on this very house and i believe it's called the demon house it was oh, available damn. on amazon prime and i rented that watched it it was a good time now a lot of the information is hard to pin down and our firsthand accounts, interviews, people that lived in this house. And it's also, uh, I'll be honest, hard to figure out what might be fact and what might be fiction, what might be elevated or exaggerated. And the reason I say that is because this house in particular is really well known for Zach Baggins coming through, buying it, making a documentary about what happened in this house, and then at the end of it, demolishing the house. So that way this house can't haunt anybody ever again. But with that comes a lot of dropped loose ends. So it's a very unique haunted house case. I may look, if I'm still a fresh little baby in this space. You're still just a summer child. Right. But this, I'm going to go as far as saying this is probably like the only case where someone is a paranormal investigator buys the place mm -hmm. and then demolishes the place oh yeah that raised some eyebrows when i first heard that i went to college not too far from here when this went down so i remember senior year at college kind of hanging out with my roommates watching ghost adventures as we did and my my buddy my uh my roommate ronak at the time was like hey, did you hear about the demon house they're calling it up in gary about an hour and a half away. And I was like, That's, we gotta go. We gotta go to this house. So close. And he's like, no, well, you know, Zach Bagan's got a hand on it. Made a documentary about it. Really fascinating. Very, it felt very real. Yeah. It, ve it felt very much like he is pursuing a lot of loose ends. This family is a little cagey, totally understandable. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then for better or worse, right? Whether it's to obfuscate the truth or to save future generations from mm -hmm. entering this house, he demolished it. So with that said, let's dive into the history of this house, some of the hauntings, as well as some of the stories that went to the hospital with some of the family members. It's not all just stuck here at the house. Oh. Things went down at the hospital as they were hospitalized. So we'll what, get into all of uh, again, that. Again, one of the things, one of the things that I learned from this podcast uh -huh. is there isn't just like a, just get out of the house. Right. Oh, These no. things stick to you and follow you mm -hmm. places. That's so messed up. Okay. It's pretty bad. <laughs> all right. So with all that said, uh, happy October, by the way, everybody. This is the culmination of our Haunted House Month. Next Monday, we have our Halloween special where you and I Whoa, went to Penhurst Asylum. Boy. We did a podcast part of it, so you get to listen to that, the stories of Penhurst. But then... While we're in Penhurst. While we are in the basement of one of the yeah. buildings, and then we go off and do the actual ghost investigation. Unlike last year, it's a separate piece of content. So mm -hmm. be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. It is Red Web Pod is the username there on YouTube. All, or you can just check out the Rooster Teeth app. We have it downloaded there as well. We have a lot of stuff. So thank you, but also... Damn y'all. <laughs> it's your support <laughs> that thrusts us into the, the, the throes of danger. 
All right. Now with all that out of the way, let's talk about the Demon House. I'll take you back to November of 2011 when the Ammons family moved into the 3800 block of Carolina Street in Gary, Indiana. Now LaToya Ammons, her three children, and her mother Rosa Campbell started experiencing strange things less than a week after moving into this small home. It's an unassuming house, a smaller house, one story, kind of square, footprint, very traditional home. Yeah, I mean, it's a small, cute home. Mm -hmm. uh, primary, it's like a mid-century suburban yeah. home. Primary color is white mm -hmm. with some hints of blue, which is the hints of blue are the, the roof looks like. Yeah, that looks like a chill home. But yep. then again, like demons could just haunt anything anywhere turns out right and i wonder why it started in 2011 in this house but we'll get into all of it so despite the weather being cold right like i said they moved in november and now we're in december the cold weather of gary indiana you got the lake effect it's cold but despite that they were seeing large horse flies on and around their porch and they kept coming back no matter what preventative measures they took they bring out exterminators doesn't matter. Get fly traps, doesn't matter. These horse flies are plaguing their front porch. So question. Yes. Are horse flies just not like a winter insect? Oh, no. Uh, I mean, they, they're they kind of one of the things that just disappears in the winter. I don't okay. know where bugs go. Right. I don't know if I want to find out. You know what I mean? I feel like it depends on the bugs. Like, look, I'm no bug specialist, but I right. feel like they like lay eggs and the eggs lay dormant and then they hatch in spring exactly. or something. Or maybe exactly. that's one specific bug. Maybe those damn mosquitoes. I hate them so much. Oh, God. But, um, okay, so they're not like a winter bug. No. And then they got exterminators out. As someone who recently got exterminators out, I mean, you get an exterminator, they come out, they do the job. Bugs exactly. go away. What? I don't got any more anthills. I don't have, I don't deal with mosquitoes anymore. So... To have an exterminator come out and you still have that problem, like you're throwing chemicals that are compounded and structured to attack these right. specific bugs. So they, they took preventative measures. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Now, starting at midnight on one of these uh, winter nights, Rosa would hear footsteps from the basement while doors in the kitchen would open by themselves. Upon inspecting both of the rooms, the kitchen and the basement, they were always vacant. So there was no seeming answer to the footsteps or what was causing them. And eventually these footsteps became a nightly occurrence. So if eventually the family's kind of getting accustomed to it. And that's how these things tend to start. They acclimate you to the normal stuff. And then they start elevating into physical presences and interactions into voices and whatnot. Now, in one instance, Latoya was woken up by a strange feeling that prompted her to look into the hallway. Just the presence of something, just something didn't sit right with her. So she wakes up, gets up out of bed, looks down the hallway, and this is when she, for the first time, finds a shadow man pacing in her living room. Oh, hell no, girl, run. Oh, yeah. Especially um, not just standing there, right? Because, like, you hear footsteps and you go, maybe it's just the house. It's creaking. I don't know. Exactly. If yeah. you saw, like, a shadow that's in the shape of a man, I would instantly go, is the moon or is there a light reflecting off of, like, the couch and mm -hmm. the the furniture in a certain way but if something's pacing back and forth that's yeah. that is what it is right i mean when you see something uh, that comes to my mind when you see a repeated pattern whether it be pacing yeah. back and forth you start to think what in the area right oscillates what in the area mm -hmm. is going to cause shadow to dance in that kind of way and they are right off a street and so is it it couldn't be a car passing by right because it's a kind of a pacing action now she goes down the hallway goes to investigate this situation and she found boot prints caked in mud where the ghost was seen walking. Now, again, I do want to say that we have a lot of doubters in the audience. We have a lot of believers in the audience, and I respect both parties mm -hmm. because we all come to play. Now, the thing is, it's so hard to figure out what is exaggerated for the True. story right. and what actually happened. And so, again, I want to say that some of these pieces might feel exaggerative, but we're going to dive into what we know because right. that's what we have. So she's saying she finds boot prints caked in mud where this shadow was or at least some sort of like yeah foreign debris the thing the thing is happening. that there could be so many levels to that right mm. there could be nothing there could be a boot print caked in mud mm. or it could just be a smear of dirt it really it really you, could you know we've I mean? seen how things have been exaggerated even right. in the, even in the blood house yeah which by the way task force you guys rock i think it was o negative is a universal donor and mm -hmm. so there could have been o blood in the house because he was on dialysis. That's a separate mystery. But it just goes oh, to show that yeah. sometimes 
smaller facts or small things can be exaggerated into bigger items. Right, it gets filtered and filtered here and there. And then also, if you see a shadow person and you see foreign mud that wasn't supposed to be there, you're going to put two and two together and you're going to be like, I'm not sleeping ever again. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing too, especially since like... Stepping on my carpet with mud. If there's like a boot size and you have it's you yeah. and your mother and your three children unless you got children with some big old feet <laughs> then okay maybe it's not paranormal but there's an intruder in there's the house. something happening yeah. right that's a really good point put up everyone's shoes that's the size <laughs> yeah. it's like a it's like the worst cinderella story i mean like if 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 my son if i had like a son that was older or, or if i had just a, a child that was older uh -huh. i mean in the morning i'd test the boot <laughs> absolutely so that's what she sees now, the family was able to live with the haunting until around March 10th of 2012, the following year. So they're they're dealing with this for four to five months. Jesus Christ. At this point, they had a family and friends gathering at their home to grieve the death of a loved one who, to this day, remains anonymous. And I think that that's totally fair. It is a personal matter. Um, but everyone's over to grieve over this loved individual. Ammons's 12-year-old daughter was found levitating above her bed completely unconscious on this day. Everyone who was attending the wake began to pray around her until the daughter fell gently back onto the bed. Those who witnessed this refused to return to the Ammons home. And at this point, the Ammons decided to look for help. At this point, they've seen too much, and now it's affecting their children, especially on such a day of grief. So they're turning to churches and anyone else who can help. The churches around them did not want to help. They wouldn't step into the property whatsoever. They didn't want to mess with whatever might have been going on in the house, or they didn't believe her. For whatever reason, they didn't want to enter that property. What the? Okay, like, maybe that's something we, like, I don't know, like a, like a mini thing we dive into or something. But, like, what is the hierarchy of, like, the church in dealing with these things? That's a good question. Like, like okay, question. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. We go out. We come back. We're getting haunted. Yes. What is the process? Right. What is what is the church hotline email? I don't know what it is. Like, who do we talk to? Like, is there requirements? Like, right? Is have, there like it, some sort of checklist? Right. Like one eight hundred churches, but they actually just play the songs from churches, and it's not actually a church. church. <laughs> yeah. That was for Jillian. She got it. I think. I don't know. But but like it's a good band. Um, <laughs> but like, you're right though. What, what is the process there? Who do you talk to? Mm -hmm. What are the requirements? Like. Are they going to be like, are you baptized? Like, you know what right, I mean? Like, right. Do you have Jesus candles in your living room? Like, I don't know what the requirements right. are. Like, it'd be so interesting to dive into the hierarchy because especially because we have had mysteries where people are like, okay, the church is sending someone in. Yes. And now here, church is like, nah, we're good. You're like, on your own. They're, well, they're not alone. They did give them advice. That, but one, one kind of metaphor or analogy I can make okay. here is like that's kind of maybe going to the doctor and saying I need a root canal now and they're like well we think we can do a drill and fill and you'll be fine right so you know so maybe it's like you don't come with your own diagnosis maybe you go to the church and you kind of like have them feel it out and so instead of just diving straight into the house and really escalating this to 11 the church instead told the Ammons to cleanse the house and you're like okay great but with more traditional means ammonia and bleach the family was told to draw crosses on the doors and wash the children with holy oil olive oil in this case. Lastly, they were urged to create a makeshift altar in the basement. And we'll talk more about that very creepy basement in a second. Ultimately, and I'll just jump to the case, this didn't really help Latoya at all or the family. So instead, she found two psychics who came and then told her that they were sharing the house with over 200 oh. demons and that she should move out immediately. This is the step usually in the, in the cases that we've talked about, right. in the stories that we've covered, that things escalate. is when you go to psychics. Now, when you go to the churches, the psychics escalate. And that's when you hit the higher levels of churches where someone from like the Vatican comes through and does like a, an exorcism. See, that's what I'm saying. What does it take for me to get a Vatican? Right. Member? Like, do you have to go around your church? Yeah. Is there a membership? Strange. I don't know. Like, like, is there, is there, I'm like legit question. Like, do you, is there stuff you got to pay for? That, like, these are all very good questions. You know, like we should do a Red Web Ace Files episode because we, we did one on um, different ghost hunting gadgets. We should yeah. do one on like what weapons or instruments the churches would use. That's actually a really, a really interesting 
I would love to learn that myself. Yeah. Right. You know, holy water, you know, the crosses right. but, and like some of the scripture that you but like read. blessed olive oil. Yeah. I didn't know that that's something you just bless olive oil. Is it just blessing liquid? Right. I don't know. But like, these are legit questions that I have now. Yeah. So at this point you're going great. Well, this family needs to move ASAP. Now, unfortunately the fan, the family couldn't afford to leave. So they were forced to stay. The more Latoya tried to read the Bible verses to perform air quotes exorcisms on her own, you know, reading these Bible passages into the house to try to just exorcise these demons from the home, the more it seemed to get problematic, right? She would also make that altar in the basement as not only the church suggested, but also the clairvoyants suggested. And the altar was essentially like a table with a white sheet over it. And on top of that was a Bible and then figurines of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. Pretty rudimentary, but a basic altar to try to evoke some sort of holy or positive vibes in, in the building, right? Look, I'm all about, you know, uh, uh, DIYs, you know, mm -hmm, do it yourselves. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like getting rid of 200 demons is like a DIY. That's you know not I mean? a YouTube the answer <laughs> kind of right. situation. There's I, no, I feel where's like, the aisle in Home Depot, right? I, right. I feel like you slip up and then boom, you're possessed. Uh, just like right because you're also kind of talking to it right which is the th the theme outside of haunted houses this month it's don't talk to demons month. right if it, it's me talking to it making it stronger mm. like i would be back and forth with so many questions right well it turns out that this makeshift altar despite it being a suggestion by many didn't seem to make much of a change in fact it seemed that the demonic activity was worsening the children were beginning to speak in tongues uh, with red bloodshot eyes, sardonic expressions. The daughter complained of being choked by an invisible force as well. The youngest son had full conversations with what he described as a ghost boy that lived in his closet. And sometimes they would attack each other while speaking in voices that weren't their own, which is a very common situation when you have a possession that, especially of children, their voices drop into a much deeper register than should be natural for their vocal cords. <laughs> it's a it's a scary situation but your child was possessed and it came at you with like a high pitch like oh they go high pitch with they it they go high pitch with it i just i it would be jarring i'll tear your soul yeah. out yeah i'll eat your soul it's just like what oh, huh? what okay it's, little man let's go back to bed right all right stop playing around <laughs> time to go to bed you need to stop watching teletubbies or whatever <laughs> right. but, you know yeah i mean I think there's no way you can cut this that doesn't just unsettle you, right? I mean, this is, th the, everything's being thrown at the wall here. Yeah. You know I mean? Oh, yeah. Limitation, possession. It's dense, see. too. It's all in a very short matter of time. Right. Which does raise eyebrows. You know what well, I mean? Also, I mean, if it is 200 demons. Mm -hmm. Where were they with the previous family? That's the question, you know? Like, well, see, I, I mean, I don't know. Because, like, yeah, I mean, that's a very valid question. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. like. Does see this is why I have questions now. Does, yeah. Does does faith come into play? If someone that doesn't believe in God, like, is that more invoking of demons? Is that less invoking of demons? Right. Right. Oh. Is that something to attach to a person with? Julian, I'd be very curious as we kind of go through this outline, if we have any evidence. Again, I know a lot of this is hard to find, but if there's any evidence of the previous owners experiencing anything. No. The um, landlord said nobody before them and nobody after had any experiences. Well, certainly nobody after. <laughs> except for Bagans. Yeah, right. But, yeah, the, the house is flat. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah it's, the landlord of a lot, I guess. It's right. not just property. Would you build a house on that lot, knowing this story? Hell no. Okay, well, what if it's, uh, what if I were to tell you it's an up-and-coming uh, nice renter's paradise? Well, then you're lying to me. <laughs> <laughs> this lot? Definitely lying. But question. Yeah. Like, now I'm just, okay, sorry. I'm just full of questions. <laughs> Go for I'm it. I'm just like, what are like the parameters, right? And like, if I build an outhouse there, will that get haunted? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, no, does, it, does it expand beyond the house? If, I, the just, land if, I, right, right. if I just pitch a tent and, and like live on that lot for like a month, well, I get haunted. It depends. If I bring, a, if I bring an RV on the yeah, lot, yeah. I get haunted? I don't know. Genuine questions. I think it all depends on the origin of this situation. Was something done between owners? Uh, was something done when it was, like, for example, a house that I bought years ago here in Austin sat abandoned for a few years before I moved in. Anybody 
could have waltzed in or out or whatever and done whatever and, and mm-hmm. could have made an altar, could have uh, done some sort of cult activity. Right. Pull the carpet up and there's some... Ugh, don't tell me that. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, like, very possible. And so it depends on the house. It was demolished. If, if this activity was attached to something in the basement, True. Uh, some sort of, I don't know, altar of its own, um, yeah, it's just... it, it could be the vessel for this energy. Yeah, so if that's I, destroyed. It, that's that's the question. I feel like there needs to be, like, I don't know. Does the Vatican have like scientists, like holy scientists? And I sound. I know that sounds like a little ridiculous, but like, I think I if think there's like so, demonic yeah. grounds and stuff like that, like, are they testing stuff? You know what I mean? They're testing different like ways to attack it. They're testing different ways to right. provoke it. I don't know. Now I'm like, thinking about Constantine too, and I'm just thinking about I'm, him going into the deep, deep basements of the Vatican, and you got like these. So excited about that. You know the like thirteen ghosts because this is the movie podcast about mysteries. It uh, is. Yes, it is. We got walls with like glyphs carved into them to entrap spirits, and then, right. you know you got uh, someone's gonna test the stuff. Cardinals out. maybe doing some sort of uh, holy deeds to these spirits. There's yep. some Exorcist animes. Blue Exorcist. <gasps> they they get, they got signed. Yeah, oh. they got a whole team of people. Of course, but also, but that. in a more real way, <laughs> <laughs> probably. No, not to disparage that, but I mean seriously, like, no, yeah, I'd be yeah. very curious what but, one thousand. But I'm sure they're very secretive about right. Uh, uh, it's uh, like uh, the president's uh, notebook. Yeah. UFOs exist, and uh, right. we we are subjugated to an intergalactic entity. Like all that, definitely. But I, I feel like no. I feel like if we were going down that area and walking through that area. Mm-hmm. As terrifying as it is, I think I'd be more just like, I don't know. Like, I, I, I would just be so surprised at everything. Mm-hmm. I'd be so curious about everything. Oh, yeah. I mean, I that's... feel like I'd be like, oh, I, I terrified for a second and go, okay, but like, how? How yeah. are you doing this? What, like, what's the story behind this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Someday, you know, I hope we can continue to elevate this show into the realms of television and I can, like, really go ask those kind of questions or really, like, the two of us go explore that That'd stuff. Be so cool. Because that's, that's, the, those are the kind of curiosities that, yeah, I got a scientific, pragmatic mind, but like, that's where I, I allow the curiosities to enter the brain and be like, right. well, we don't know everything. Right. What, what could answer the things that we don't know? And I, and I get that. That's like, super cool stuff. And I get that the about. church and science clash, mm. but is there any point that they do mesh together? Right. Is there an overlap of right. unknown mm-hmm. that they have a mutual yeah. understanding? So coming back to this particular situation, you know, the, the kids now are speaking in voices that don't seem of their own. They're now attacking or fighting one another more often uh, out of character. In fact, the violence started to get too extreme for both Latoya and her mother Rosa, because one of the boys actually attacked Rosa, the grandmother, by headbutting her in the stomach. And at this point, they're like, this is this is too too far. And so on April 19th of 2012, Dr. Jeffrey Onyuku was called to the house, and the boys started to scream and curse at the doctor to the point where DCS and CPS were called by the doctor's office. That is the Department of Child Services and the, the Child Protective Services. And when the police arrived, they themselves witnessed one of the sons get thrown into a wall by some form of invisible force. This is not one of the only stories that an external party has witnessed something. Now, the police have seen something, but I'm about to get into it where there's a hospitalization and activity goes down at the hospital. Thank God, because nothing makes me sigh more than in movies where someone sees something and it doesn't say anything oh or someone gosh. sees something and then like it doesn't happen when right like, it's like that like this is a terrible situation mm-hmm. but the fact that you can go outside of my inner most yeah. circle yeah this is a complete stranger that is seeing the wild stuff that's happening here and then obviously the the very nice second part of that is that you know this is all child uh protective services and all mm-hmm. kind of stuff it's like okay Look, we were coming to question whether or not you should have your children, but right. the, obviously there's some stuff way above our pay grade happening here. I can't, you know, they're not going to be so easy to just pull the trigger and be like, you have like right. an unstable household. They're not I'm here to prove, the kids. right, which, which happens a lot. They're here yeah. to prove what they thought coming in. In this case, like, of course, they're out here to protect yeah. uh, the kids in this yep. case in their best and, and really investigate what's going down. And then the police witness something that they couldn't properly explain. And at this point, the two boys, there is the daughter on the side. And then there's these two boys 
were brought to the hospital, at which point both of them lost consciousness. So let's talk about that now. We have nurse Willie Lee Walker, accompanied by CPS case manager Valerie Washington and Campbell. Campbell being Rosa, the grandmother. They took the two boys into a small room for examination. The seven-year-old was growling at his brother and said, quote, it's time to die, I will kill you, in a deep voice that was not his own. The brother then headbutted him in the stomach before the grandmother broke them apart and began to pray. While the youngest boy spoke, the older brother started headbutting Campbell in the stomach. The CPS case manager, Washington, told Zach Baggins in his documentary that during an interview with the family, the seven-year-old had a, quote, weird grin, which now I'm only thinking about the movie Smile. Mm -hmm. But basically, as they're talking to this young boy, he has this sinister grin on his face. I think this is the first time I've ever really heard of this, you know, isn't so uncommon, but it's more rare to have multiple possessions, Mm -hmm. right? So the two children are being possessed. Mm -hmm. Um, But this is the first time I've ever heard of two people or multiple people being possessed and then going after each other. Right. So like, in all like seriousness, do these two demons have beef with each other? Like what? Like what? That's a good question. Like why would they attack each other? It seems like also Ooh. it's primarily each other. If anyone gets in the way, then they outlash towards that person. Right, right. But it seems like they go directly towards and gravitate towards each other. I'm curious if it isn't just a divide and conquer sort of situation. Uh, oh, that, that's true. Territory. Yeah, like these demons are territorial. Basically, just try, trying to tear down these relationships. I mean, family comes before literally everything. And so maybe these demons are just like, let's see if I can divide the relationship of these brothers. Uh, and then between the brothers True. and the grandparents or the mom or the sister. And just like whatever energy they feed off of, it might be that discourse that they then sow between them all. And, and Good point. Yeah, I don't know. But so he had this weird grin during these interviews. Uh, again, that's per Zach Baggins' documentary in talking to the CPS case manager. Now, this is the the piece of the story that I, that got me morbidly curious in this case uh, at the time of it going down because it's what hit the news. Nurse Walker said that she witnessed the seven-year-old boy, quote, walk up a wall to the ceiling where he jumped down with a flip and landed on his feet. That is the story that was pervasive at the time of this going down. And basically that multiple people at the hospital had seen this kind of activity. Is no one like whipping out phones? That's that. You know what? It is the age of phones. I'm really looking for some evidence here. I mean, right off the rip, you were like 2011. I was like, okay. Like, I, it kind of like in this headspace that we do episodes, where mm-hmm. you give me the date and then go, okay, so I have to shave off this chunk of technology. Right. You know we're what I mean? iPhone 4 or right. something. Right. And so it's like, uh, man, that, that's. I don't know. I feel like you whipped the phone out. Yeah. It's just kids and grandma. Just kids and grandma. So, I mean, yeah, you're, you're right, Jillian. There might not be phones amongst the family and then the nurses, that's like a HIPAA situation. Yeah. Like Even then, like a digital camera. Security like, footage. Security footage. Unless it's in the room itself. It, I mean, your your instinct is correct. I th- especially nowadays, where, ev- where everything is broadcast right. on social. Even to a dangerous point, I feel like everyone would try and get close and capture evidence of it and put themselves in danger. Mm-hmm. I think we're in that extreme direction now, but we'll yeah. see. It'll be like, we've talked about it before, but it'd be very interesting to see what comes up in like the modern age of mm-hmm. like hauntings and stuff. What, how a case like this would fare even 10 years on, like this right. year. Yeah. Cause I mean, you're right. I mean, you know, we broke down case files. There's like TikToks where it's like security cameras and nest footage and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, well, we gotta get come on. We gotta get those 4K videos. Yeah, I think we're still sticking to the 480 somehow. Yeah, it's, yeah, but it's um, yeah. but yeah, it just with this, with regards to this particular story, there's an unnamed psychologist who was also in the room at the time, saw the same thing, and both Washington and this doctor allegedly ran from the room in a panic after seeing this incident. Now, this is the second person that we've talked about who wanted to remain anonymous. This is a pretty common trend for this particular story family members, professionals around the family wanting to stay anonymous and not at all get into whatever was going on here. So is there, is it verified in any way that these are actually people? Yes, absolutely. The people are totally real. Okay. Now I know that we're not into the theory section at all yet, but I know what kind of comes to mind is 
are these stories exaggerated not for the sake of maybe attention, but sometimes that's part of it, looking for a book deal, movie right. deal, whatever. Or sometimes it's also like when you believe this kind of thing mm -hmm. and your brain is wanting, not wanting it to be demonic, but like you believe so fully in, in that idea right. and you're so scared that something more mundane can evolve in your memories while you're in that heightened fear. Right. To, to suddenly now it's not a kid just kind of rolling up against the wall, but instead they're running up the wall, back flipping off the wall and landing on their feet. True. You know, it can... And then like, what do you do if it's subtle where it's like the kid took two steps, three steps off the wall or half step off the wall and then mm -hmm. did a flip and you're just like, no, 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 that's not normal. It might sound normal, but it's really not. Right. I think the, the big thing that's tearing me part pull me back and forth with this so far is the fact that it all sounds so outlandish it does it's it's like this is like ladies and gentlemen we got them right you know exactly like there is uh there's all kinds of magic tricks happening all mm -hmm. around uh, and but you have so many people that are third parties strangers random people professionals that are seeing this mm -hmm. and so I, the thing I don't believe the most is the fact that like this family's convincing everyone to be on board with this like hoax. You know what I mean? Like if, and so it's like I just I don't know. That's why I'm so torn. Yeah, you got so many people who are like I saw this. Right. I, it's it's tough. You you know like when you sit there as a human being, you want to respond to that and be like, not often do you hear a story like this. Right. And of course, especially when there are victims involved and things like this are happening to people and they're scared or sometimes they're hurt. You don't want to sit there and just be like, and eh, they're making it up. But but I mean, you're right. I mean, that's the natural instinct when there's the absence of proof is to go, this is pretty heightened. And I'm pretty blown away that we're not getting a lot of direct mm -hmm. evidence. But yeah, that's what makes this case so interesting. Yeah. And, and also kind of frustrating because you can't really dive into like, let's really, really fact check all this. Because yeah. a lot of it, it almost feels, as Kelsey uh, Charles was putting this, the haunted detective, as she was kind of helping with this outline, she was saying like she herself felt that perhaps some of this information was scrubbed from the internet or at least modified in some way. So this is definitely a nebulous case. And I think as time goes on, it's only going to evolve or get thinner because a lot of this oh, stuff will completely. get lost. Yeah. Yep. Hey there, everybody. Christian here. Just wanting to jump in, take care of some orders of business as usual, and then we'll get right back into the episode. First off, I want to let you know that Red Web Case Files will be going on a small mid-season hiatus. Stay tuned to our Twitter at RedWebPod for the latest information on when the show will be returning. And we hope you've been enjoying it so far. It's been a blast to make, and we're excited to finish the season with you. And now, a word from our sponsors. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by Pray for the Devil in theaters this Halloween weekend. This movie looks scary, Task Force. And played by Jacqueline Byers, believes she is answering a call to be the first female exorcist. But who or what called her? At the start of the movie, the Catholic Church reopens its exorcism school thanks to a rise in global demonic possessions. But previously, they've only trained men in the rite of exorcism. Anne is the first woman ever to be trained as an exorcist. But quickly, she finds herself in battle for the soul of a young girl who she suspects is possessed by the same demon that once possessed Anne's mother. And the demon wants Anne. So is Anne answering her spiritual calling? Or does the devil have her right where it wants her? This movie looks like a lot of fun. It looks like a perfect Halloween time movie. The best kind of horror movie to get scared and scream with your friends. Pray for the Devil is in theaters this Halloween weekend. Get tickets at bit.ly slash pray red web. That's bit.ly slash P-R-E-Y red web. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by BetterHelp. We live in a complicated world, especially now. And sometimes, we can get stuck focusing on the problems instead of the solutions. But sometimes, finding a solution is just a matter of changing our mindsets. But retraining your brain can be hard, especially on your own. And that's where going to therapy can really help. Many people have found therapy so helpful and they were able to make big, positive changes in their lives. Even the small changes can have such a huge impact. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is an option. They're convenient, affordable, accessible, and they're entirely online. You can get matched with a therapist after you fill out an online survey 
and you have the ability to switch therapists at any time so you can find the right fit for you. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash RedWeb today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash RedWeb. And now, back into the mystery. Enjoy. So, all right, let's let's continue on because after all this went down, uh, the children underwent a psychological examination. And at, at this point, they didn't really see any abnormalities in their mental health. And so at this point, professionals are really kind of at a loss for what might be happening here. And even though this did happen in front of nurses, a psychologist, in front of one of the DCS employees, the kids were promptly removed from both their mother and their grandmother and their home to be taken into DCS custody for the sake of at least protecting them. Not to say that it was the parents or anything, right. but regardless, something's happening. We need to make sure these kids are all right. The hospital actually reached out to a reverend named Michael Maginot to exercise one of the boys in particular. He experienced everything that the family did, and the reverend determined that the house itself was possessed by demons and advised that the family leave ASAP. Meanwhile, the DCS was conducting their own investigation with the aid of the police department and Valerie Washington. Washington was quick to decide that she wanted no part in the house and never went back to that house. On the police side, we have Officer Charles Austin, who checked out the house to make sure that the living conditions were suitable for children. I think that is a, a an appropriate move. Before yep. I dive into the deets, you want to make sure that there is no carbon monoxide in the air, which could cause all sorts of physical ailments that could be misinterpreted. It could cause hallucinations of a sort. And right. Toxins could be about, you know, you never know with an older house what could be happening to cause things. So it's always worth having someone check it out. A uh, home inspector, typically, but in this mm -hmm. case, a police officer. So he walked in, and the first thing that he noticed were the excessive amount of Bibles, candles, and crosses. He, too, experienced the same thing that the reverend and the family did. Uh, I guess footsteps, sounds of that nature, doors opening, closing. I'm not sure if he himself saw the shadow person, though. Officer Austin also took photos and videos in the basement. And if you saw this basement, man, would you tell me 100% that house is haunted. He claimed in the basement that one of the photos, which ended up coming out quite cloudy, in fact, that in that cloudiness, he could see someone's face. There was also another photo that was looked at years later, uh, I believe in 2014, that was provided by the police. And in this photo, it appeared that there was a figure standing on a porch. I'll leave it at that because this particular photo is hard to figure out if it's authentic or not, or if it was doctored or not but there is at least that other piece of evidence, as it were. In fact, I have that photo with me right now. So, oh God. again, as always, we'll post them on our social media, at RedWebPod. And if we forget, you guys have been great about <laughs> tweeting us to make sure that we don't forget. But yeah, this basically, when you look at the front porch in one of the screens, uh, one of those bug proof screens, you kind of see the outline of what looks almost like a Slenderman. Yeah, I was about to say, like an alien, like a Slenderman. Yeah, tall, thin figure. I mean, it is not it dark is, it, either. No. Normally it's shadowy. No. But this is like a lighter uh, figure yeah. on a darker background, which is not like you're typically normally you see the shadowy figure. In this case, right. it's like a cloud, a cloudy figure, you know? it's It feels like it looks to me like um, I would go with like Slenderman, Alien, and like white, white skin. And mm -hmm looking like pretty tall mm -hmm. like like six foot at least and just right there at the window right i mean there. that is it's a, it's a pretty clear photo of a very figure. it's very clear yeah man does that give you the heaves and the jeebs that's just oh it's just very clear yeah like to the point where i'm like oh this is maybe just like a mannequin in which you dress you know maybe you have some clothing there maybe you're yeah. sewing something or like, if I pass this mm -hmm. at a house, mm -hmm. I would think, "Oh, is it Halloween?" Like, <laughs> I'd think change change right. your decor, man. You're right. freaking me out. Like it's it's hey, it's the summer. Halloween's not around yet. Yeah. It, it looks like you know figures that are in props that are around my neighborhood. People are just putting up props. Absolutely. And I'm just like, okay, that's a scary prop. Halloween's around is, the corner. Yeah, you're right. To, to me, now that I'm looking at it again, is like a very spherical but tiny head. Mm -hmm. Very long, skinny neck. 
narrow shoulders. So you you end up with that alien look, that feel, that mm -hmm. uncanny feel. Or you're right, or like a prop, like a, like decor. But very interesting. Now there were two rooms in the basement. Kind of coming back to the police officer investigating. There were two rooms in the basement, and the door on the left would move itself into different positions while he was investigating. The basement was unfinished in one of the areas under the stairs, in fact, which was filled in with dirt. This is a spot that Zach himself kind of investigates in his documentary. Austin found remnants of candles, and he claimed it seemed ritualistic. Now, the question is, was this from the family trying to cleanse the house, or was it to my kind of fire from the hip theory earlier, was this somebody else that maybe squatted in this abandoned home between ownership kind of doing some rituals? I mean, it's not its not an uncommon thing that people do rituals in unoccupied homes. So wait, did the family... Was the, was the family not aware of this space? They were definitely down there, but I don't know if they looked as closely under the stairs as maybe they should have. They right. probably didn't. Why? I mean, it's definitely, I'm trying to visualize it from the documentary. It's tucked under there pretty tightly. Okay. It's very dirty because it's essentially like a, just a raw floor. Yeah. Um, it's not like a finished basement with a uh, concrete. I mean, you know? look, it makes complete sense. Like, yeah. it, I, I got my place. I have an attic. I have not been in that attic. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so you could be like, how they not know We've that there's... Sinister. You don't want right, to go up there. There's demonic rituals that uh -huh. went down the attic. I'm like, I don't go up there. What the hell am I going up there like, for? Maybe the missus like, needs to poke her head up there with a bright flashlight and make sure that there's just nothing kicking about. Not... Things, but like <laughs> items, I had, totems. I, well, I will say I was completely serious. I had people come and like wire the house. Uh -huh. And I was like, look, I haven't been up there. If you guys see anything weird, don't touch it. Don't open it. And let me know. Yeah. They didn't tell me anything. So I'm they assuming. left something, certainly. <laughs> All right. So Jillian has at least a rough photo for us to look at for the basement. What are you seeing? What are you feeling? So you just got stairs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, this is very well lit because, you know, I mean, this was purposely taken in um, with them trying to show detail. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a door. You're looking at stairs and then there's a bunch of dirt under the stairs. Mm hmm. Starting to wonder, Grandma Rosa, what were you up to? Right. <laughs> Start blaming Grandma. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, oh, man. It, it, there's it's, some dark, like, it's circular It's not area. as tucked away as I thought it would be. Yeah. This, there's yeah. like maybe eight steps, and there's gigantic gaps between the steps. What if, what if like the kids had friends that would like dabble with stuff that they didn't properly know? And so, like, the kids could easily get up under there. And then maybe that's why the boys were more inclined to be experiencing something. Oh. Not only their proximity to whatever ritual might, what might have happened, right. but also like just indulging yeah. in that world for a minute yeah. puts your head in that space they open the know. book yeah never open the book you mustn't read Let's from the, the book. book so austin coming back to him he found those candles under the stairs he claims that they were ritualistic now when he left the house drove down the street went to a nearby gas station he noticed a few things that he he thought were of note uh, he pulled over to the gas station and at that point almost on the dot his radio goes to complete static and he's like, and eh, whatever, maybe I just lost signal. But before he could turn it off, there was a deep voice that came through the static, through his radio, that said, quote, who in there? That's how he heard it. Who Somebody would? asking for who was in there or who is in there. But yeah, so he believes coming out, like kind of closing all that before we move into the police investigation, he believes that the entity primarily targeted women and children, which this house was specifically filled with. Two women, three children. Stronger men, he says, would only experience the technological anomalies that he experienced. But then again, you look at any other case, any other demonic possession, and, you know, uh, children tend to be a more popular target of these sort of things. But I will say that men certainly are, I mean, he, he, he might be Braveheart here, but he is absolutely uh, a viable target to an entity of this caliber. You know what I mean? I would think so. I mean, look yeah. at Amityville. Exactly. Exactly. But let's talk about that police investigation, then we'll wrap up with some of the theories that uh, might help bring some closure to what went down here. So around the same time, there was a different officer, Lieutenant John Gruska, who was interviewing people in the house with a voice recorder, a typical voice recorder that one might use to find EVPs, electronic voice phenomenon. And I say that because when he played back his very recording on those interviews, there was a distinct disembodied voice that was not his not the person answering his questions, someone else that said the word 
quote, Hey, I'll use my voice now. Hey, said hey. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Just for clarity. But yeah, he heard like a whispery in the background kind of hey. Now, after this information was relayed to all involved parties, the reverend went to check out the basement where he became convinced that there was a body buried in that basement. The police dug into the area the reverend pointed out, but did not find a body. Instead, they uncovered women's underwear, children's socks, a red pan, a pink fake nail, and a comb. They also found an odd sticky liquid, the police, I should say, and typically where they found this odd sticky liquid was the blinds, kind of dripping down the middle of the blinds. Condensation? Yeah, maybe condensation picking up some grime and some, like, you know, dust dust and whatever, and then it dries, the water evaporates, and it kind of goes back and forth, especially if, like, you have a smoker in the house, you get some of that tar that attaches to the windows, picks up in the water, and you end up with a a stick. You look at that. We might have just debunked it. However, the police described it as an oil. Not the first time we've talked about oil in this situation. Perhaps the family might have used that holy olive oil Thrown up on the windows. Right. Because it did, didn't they, um, didn't the church or the priest, something like that, say to like throw up crosses on the doors and windows or something? Yeah. They recommended cleaning with ammonia and bleach, told them to draw crosses on the doors and wash the children in holy oil. Now, if they drew those crosses on the window with this oil, bada boom, bada bing. Go back to what I'm telling you. Exactly. We don't, like I said, you know, a little uh, DIY. Mm-hmm. You just start experimenting because it's like I threw it on the door. I I got I got the stuff in my hand. Mm-hmm. Oh, on the windows. Windows kind of a door, but also like just an opening in the is wall. Is it every door? I, I think they talked about all the points of entry. Yeah, draw crosses on the doors. They said specifically the doors, but you know what? If you're going Bathroom ham on, on two hundred demons, get your windows. Right. Get your faucets. Get any entry point. I just. I don't have so many questions. Like, what about the bathroom door? Does mm-hmm. that count? Does that not count? Like, these are serious questions. I mean, they are 100%. But yeah, they described this this odd sticky liquid on the window as an oil. There was never any resolution as to where the substance came from or what, in fact, it was. But the new DCS agent, Samantha Illick, claimed that her hand went painfully numb when she touched it. The three police officers present described her hand as turning white, like there was almost no circulation in it when she touched it. And so placebo effect perhaps happening in here. Yeah, I just, we have a lot of people. I think I think a lot of these individuals, despite being police or doctors or DCS agents or the family themselves, I think are all potentially very religious. And when you are very religious and you start entering this kind of arena, we've seen it in other cases before, it becomes a spiral where you your belief begets deeper belief begets more symptoms and you can have a very heightened placebo effect sort of right. situation. But I also don't want to discount what she might have actually been going through. You just don't know. True. But I mean, if you're going in there already expecting stuff. Ooh, now, it's, yeah, that's true. If you're expecting stuff. Yep. Mm-hmm. Now, this part's interesting. I, I, sorry, I read ahead silently. That no matter how much they cleaned these areas in particular, this sticky, oily substance would continue to reappear with no apparent indication as to where it was coming from or why. And so we might have low-key debunked it, but if the family is now gone, they're like, they've vacated this house and everyone keeps coming in to investigate. They clean off this oil and it comes back. Question then is, where is it coming from? Is it a byproduct from some sort of animal or bugs? You know, like I, I'm not going to get too, too TMI, but in that old house that was once abandoned that I lived in, boy, did they have a cockroach problem for the first year I was there. And those <laughs> little guys like to like, it's like a, it's like a black sticky tarry substance that they like excrete and oh. that's that's their waste. Um, so you'll just end up with that stuff on your walls sometimes and you're going to go, oh, come on, oh. you know, wipe it off. So, I mean, yeah, it, yeah, it could have knows? an infestation that's constantly messing with the blinds. Yeah. Man, it's just it's unfortunate because like take video footage, take I don't, right, I don't right. know. Like if it turned white, eat like look, I, as much as I want nothing, nothing, I'm like, I don't want I don't want to be in the house. I won't touch nothing, I won't see nothing, mm-hmm. I won't hear nothing. Like, I'm so far on that end of the spectrum. If you touched it and it turned your hand turned white, I'd be like, look, record this. I gotta know. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna touch it now. What's gonna happen to me? Yeah, let's take a sample. Let someone else touch it. You know. I mean, if we're there, get that in stuff the moment, tested. We're already like 
in the thing. But the, again, this is me on like deep on one side of the scale. Mm -hmm. There's other people that are more than willing. That's, That's like, true. You know what I mean? And so, oh man, like, like I could say it a million times, but just like, I don't know. I just feel like you just record it. Like I, I would be a little frustrated and surprised if over the next, like, I don't know, a couple of decades or whatever, we're not, we get all these mysteries, like, and it's not more us or everyone just debunking a bunch of footage and photos. Hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. With so how, like, with how abundant, like, and, like, everyone's phone, like, phones and uh, modern smartphones and et cetera. I feel like there could be a world where all these mysteries, it's just like, okay, and this is the video footage. Okay, here are the set right. of photos. Because, like, why wouldn't you? Video technology tests are mm -hmm. all getting way more accessible and way yeah. more cost effective. And, in fact, on this point, like, I mentioned, like, why not get this tested? It is worth mentioning for anybody, who, which might be most people who are unfamiliar with this case, this is a lower income area. This family is not necessarily wealthy. Like I mentioned earlier, they mm -hmm. felt trapped by the home because they couldn't afford to leave, yeah. which is totally fair. And under those circumstances, you can't just kind of like, maybe maybe they don't have a phone or technology or True. at least not the means to really scientifically analyze the substances and what's all going down here. Hence, turning to the people that they but turn they to. But they had a lot of other people cycle in and out. Absolutely. Though. That's true. So at this point, you know, things are things are pretty grim. And they run an unofficial exorcism performed by Maginot on the house and Latoya herself. Uh, we say unofficial because it was not approved by the church and it was used to verify the claim of demonic activity, not necessarily to fully fix it. And again, you can't really call it an exorcism without the church's full approval, which we know the church kind of like poo-pooed on the idea. So Latoya had an aversion to the holy objects, such as a cross and a Bible, which is interesting considering the amounts that were present in the house. Right. And because of this aversion, Maginot was pretty convinced that like, okay, yeah, it seems that there is some sort of demonic activity happening here because that is not typical, especially of this particular woman who was religious and had these things just in her house. And so now to have this aversion definitely feels akin to a demonic possession. Additionally, they had three police officers present at the entire exorcism. and um, Love that. I right. love that. Making sure that it's safe. Nothing's going to go off the rails. Right. And you also have Like, why witnesses. wouldn't you have witnesses, mm -hmm. authorities, proper people, etc. Like, get more eyes on it. Yeah. And so at this point, yep, they kind of confirmed Maginot's suspicions that not only is there some sort of demonic activity here, but it might have, if not definitely attached itself to Latoya. Oof. So then Father Maginot requested permission to conduct a formal exorcism on right. Latoya Ammons. They did this at St. Stephen's Church and it took two hours. Latoya finally felt free after Maginot was done and Illich claims that exactly one month after the exorcism, she had a series of unusual and unfortunate events. She broke three ribs and suffered from third degree burns, for example. So it seems that while it might have cleansed Latoya, Ammons, it might not have left everybody who was party firsthand to these uh, to what they saw. Oh, wow. Illich, just to be sir, was the DCS agent, Samantha Illich. So she's now the one who is worried that some sort of splash on effect might have happened to her. Now, during this time, the Ammons, and sh the Ammons children remained in DCS custody for about six months until they then again returned back to Latoya. They moved out of the house and have not had any paranormal experiences ever since, thank goodness. And people who lived in the house before, uh, as we mentioned, hadn't experienced anything either. So it seemed like something might have happened before they moved in, what have you. We'll, we'll kind of dissect what might have gone down in just like maybe 30 seconds in the theories. But as we button up this whole case, as I've kind of hinted at, Zach Bagans purchased this home to film his uh, documentary, Demon House, but also demolished it when that whole film was done to ensure that this house was no longer going to haunt anybody else. He demolished it in 2016. The haunting and inexplicable events that he witnessed and went through during his documentary, which are pretty well captured, prompted his decision to flatten the home. And I, I will say, just so you don't have to watch it if you're not interested, 
there was a pretty strong moment of a shadow person, a shadow entity arriving. I don't think that in this moment they were meant to be filming. They were kind of like filming some behind the scenes stuff. They walked past one of the bathrooms, turning the corner to go to one of the bedrooms, and they saw what looked like a demonic, like a bust, like shoulders yeah. and head. And they didn't notice that until they reinvestigated the footage. And at that point, the cameraman who uh, inadvertently filmed that had some sort of like weird, just not feeling good moments. They kicked up the cameras and started filming that. Yeah, I mean, if, if you really want to dive into their exploration of this story, uh, go check out that documentary. But it, uh, it's wild. Damn. You see, it's like there's the HD cameras, and that's. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm not sitting here going like that's it. Yeah. All right. So let's move on to the theories, as is common when we talk about haunted houses or anything that are hard to prove. One of the common ones is a hoax. Now, sometimes the theory of it being a hoax are quite flimsy, not a lot of evidence to support it. But in this case, we have a lot to discuss. So we're going to start off with the idea that uh, this whole situation might have been some form of a hoax. The Ammons family may have made these events up so they didn't have to pay for the house. It was how this theory kind of unfolds. Interesting. That, you know, in the past, we've talked about, even with Amityville, we've talked about the family moving in with the intent of having a book deal or a movie deal. In this case, the theory is that perhaps the family was financially underwater after buying the home and not being able to leave or what have you. Like, these stories came out to really exaggerate the case and be like, hey, out of a measure of health and safety, we need to leave and be allowed to leave. Oh, okay. I yeah. was wondering, like, how's how's that gonna get him out of the house? That's that re realistically, that isn't going to address your financial or contractual obligations. Yeah. Um, but it might it might bring about a, a ghost hunter, Zach Bagans, who knows yeah. a lot about it and wants to say, Hey, I'll buy the house just to investigate it, you know? Yeah. Maybe. Or maybe that's just like it just happened to work out that way that they wanted to leave and he wanted to investigate, yeah. you know? So as this theory goes to substantiate the, the idea, people claim that the Ammons might have thought that the legal issues and like all of the complications that arise with such a case may have been able to justify their inability to pay the, the bills or the mortgage or what have you. Additionally, as we mentioned before, landlord Charles Reed said that there were no issues with the house before nor were there any after. And so it does realistically raise an eyebrow as right. to why this particular family in this moment, but never anyone else. Also like hundreds side. of demons. It's a lot. It's a pretty you, hefty how sum. How do you not get one to mess with the previous owners? Especially not the, at, like later. Yeah. Right. And that's where you end up with a theory that's kind of, again, I always harken back to Mothman, where was it a case where someone saw something it got elevated yeah because of that shared belief and that shared fear it spread and then it spread beyond the family and then took on a form of its own True. so whether it be for not being able to pay the finances or what have you i think there's definitely something here with a contagious fear i don't think it has to be as underhanded as oh well let's use this right. for gain you know but uh you know we talked about the hospital and the doctor who wanted to maintain anonymity was also skeptical of demonic possession and reported that the children often did not attend school. He wrote that the family had, quote, delusions of ghost in home in their medical records. Another kind of less direct route that approaches the hoax theory is that perhaps the town itself pulled together to get attention and money for either tourism, TV channels, or what have you. Because if the town perhaps was actively losing money, then attention from mainstream media, whether it be negative or otherwise, could bring new attention to this area. And if that's the case... That's so elaborate. It is very elaborate. <laughs> very elaborate. I, I kind of think that this theory is using the ends to justify the means, right? They're using the fact that Zach Baggins came through yeah. and then saying, oh, that's what you wanted. And I'm like, I couldn't... Listen, there are plenty of haunted houses around the world if I wanted to do this hoax, if I wanted to do something like this, right. I don't think I could drum up a decent enough story to just guarantee right. that I would be able Plan to financially move out from the house. Yep. So yeah, it's worth discussing, but it is, it's also a very specific. You're going to look at it and you're working your theory about it mm -hmm. from the tail end. Yeah. I've been going backwards. Right. They also didn't publicize the theory or their story until about 2014. That like, 
So it happened in 2011, 2012, but the Ooh. story didn't come out until 2014. So that doesn't say it's a hoax or not, but I really doubt it. But it brings, it really leaves room for skepticism, right? Yeah. So with, with the idea of discussing a hoax, there's a lot of different angles we could go with. We're talking about some of the common ones we've seen in yeah. researching this, but either way, this case does leave a healthy room for skepticism. Whether it be something like, well, let's just try to get out from finances, or it just being like, I don't know, we somebody saw something and then it spread out of control, and maybe it wasn't something. I mean, the fact it doesn't that have it was, to be nefarious, yeah, right? Yeah, that's true. The fact that it's three years later to me, I mean, who is that patient, right? Like that's that's such a long term investment, and mm. most people don't even want to do that with their money, right? So I, that that always kind of just like breaks down the hoax theory for me when when it's like and five years later the media took right. all of it and it's just like where was the gain there for mm -hmm. them to to have that um yeah that's true but it was just so it's so vivid this story yeah like and so many people experiencing it it's so vivid a lot of people experiencing it yet not a lot of tangible stuff yeah another possibly more realistic angle to this otherwise broad strokes hoax theory is that the kids it, it surrounds the kids themselves you know they just moved and it is not uncommon for kids to kind of act out when they're removed from their social circles and when they only have their family now in a strange area and so this other angle to the hoax theory is that the kids knew their mom was scared knew that their mom was of a deep belief and they acted in a way that almost validated that fear not with the intent of like maybe just being mean definitely not with the intent of this going further than just a prank but you know if they were able to get special attention whether it be positive or negative from their mother and their grandmother because of this behavior maybe it could become a vicious cycle where it would spiral out of control whereas it started as like oh let's like do a ritual under the stairs with these candles oh they haven't noticed like maybe maybe we speak with weird voices and like again with no aim in sight kids are going to be kids and and maybe it just that, took on a life of its own. <clears throat> but at that point, though, you have to believe that there's a chain reaction of placebo effect. Uh -huh. The mom seeing a figure goes beyond Ooh. them and their and their most likely their capability of like right. putting that together. Then you have a bunch of third parties, professionals, law enforcement, etc., experiencing a placebo effect as well. Mm -hmm. Like that's. That's the thing. Like, it's, you you have to believe there's a chain there. Then that's happening, and mm. that's 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 a tougher sell, right? It, it definitely the is. Ini the initial part, the initial bite of this is like the kids are messing right. with her, or or they heard about the shadow right. entity, and they're like, well, maybe we can lean into this, right? Just because kids, well, yeah. But the larger piece of the meal is well, now that also has to spiral for a right handful of people, right? Otherwise, these other parties would have been like, no, nothing's happening. Exactly. Which to that point, again, oh. there's a few unnamed individuals in this case that want to stay anonymous. And that's fair. This unnamed child psychologist that we referred to uh, quite a bit back now had this to say, quote, the children were acting deceptively and in accordance with their mother's beliefs, end quote. And that when asked a question, it seemed that they didn't want to answer. They would then act as this person put it, quote, possessed. So it could be that, again, we don't know the reasonings underneath it all, but that there could have been some sort of bouncing back and forth between beliefs and acting in a certain way, whether it be to try to leave the house or whether it be just like, oh, well, my mom's scared by this and I'm kind of acting in this situation. I don't know. It's, I don't want to vilify the family, you know, for acting in oh, these means, but that's kind of... Yeah. One of the things that's been discussed is like, well, maybe the, the kids were coached to act a certain way Yeah, for whatever means those might be. I don't know. But then you just had a bunch of people that just spiraled because they wanted to or expected to experience something. That, mm -hmm. Like a ton of. <laughs> yeah. But to further kind of dive into we're, we're this is kind of the, 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 the last piece to this hoax. It's what is the motive? Is the motive to leave the house? Is the motive to get attention? Is the motive financially for the town? Well, there's another motive in play that fuels a lot of people to believe the hoax angle. The next one comes from Zach Bagans' own documentary. He talks about how there was a Hollywood producer who wanted to sue him 
for the story rights to this house. The family and he were trying to make an actual horror movie about the events, he being the producer, uh, this anonymous producer, not Zach. And to further this theory, Latoya and Rosa refused to speak with Bagans when he visited for the documentary, claiming that they were too scared of the attachment that he might have now to having been in the home. I also know that when I watched the documentary that some of the family members who might have seen stuff were rightfully so very cagey, very defensive. And Zach kind of explored that idea, like, is it because of what they experienced, which is valid, or is it because of the idea that this story could be sold, which again, substantiates some yeah. of the motive. Ultimately, some of these things do raise suspicions and some people see that it is suspicious how vocal Latoya was to news channels about the incident, but then didn't want to be vocal with somebody who was trying to properly investigate it, i.e. Zach Baggins. It's hard to say. There's a lot of there's a lot of money and yeah. motive floating around on all but, sides. Here. But also, I'll be honest. Go for it. This happened to me. It was terrible. This oh, is yeah. this is unfortunate. At the end of the day, if someone's gonna be like, look, you want some money, make a movie out of it, I'm like, sure, sell my story. Sure. Like, right. Like, at, like let me I, get out of here. I'm I, I've been traumatized. Mm -hmm. I I have been put through the ringer. I'm at least gonna make some money off of it. Absolutely. <laughs> like, sorry. <laughs> absolutely. No, I I totally feel that. I would absolutely do the same. Yeah. You think I'm gonna pocket the, uh, the my scars and just be like, no, I'll just live with it silently. No, right. dude, get that out of your head. Yeah. Get some like not attention, but like you. There's almost something healing about like the world going. We see you. Yeah. We saw your experience. We feel that. You know, yeah. and then also getting paid never hurts. But moving on, that's, you know, again, there's a few angles to the hoax theory there. But there's another theory there that this house could have been a portal or that there could have been a portal within the house that could account for the countless entities in this home. Again, that medium had referred to the fact that there were 200 demons living in the house and a portal. We've talked about these before, but for anybody who might be new to the task force, a portal could be a tear in the dimensional fabric, whether it leads to heaven, to hell somewhere unbeknownst to us, you know, somewhere unknown altogether, or something just completely strange to us, it's unclear. But this portal idea could explain why, at least for a time, this house had so much access to so many entities. Where's like, it's all like, all like terrible, bad. And all these hauntings and ghouls and ghosts and portals to like hell and everything like that. Like, where's... Where's the house that just has Miracle House? Good things happening all the time. Right. Where's the house that just like I'm never sick ever. Never ever sick. I grew seven feet today. Yeah. Well, maybe not today. Maybe I grew to seven <laughs> feet right. total. And you know, like where where's that house? Everyone that lives here is the healthiest human being. You know what? That science can't determine. I think we got it. Why? When something good happens, people oh, tend Lord, to claim credit, right? Okay. They want to be like, I did that. Oh. When something bad happens, they want to be like, mm -mm, wasn't me, must have been something else. Yeah. And so if you are true. living in one of the miracle houses where there's a portal to somewhere more positive yeah, and I'm you working. got it and you got the opposite of maybe, I don't know, using this language here, localized demon yeah. and angel, you got an angel kind of puppeting your hands and making you the best guitar player in the world. Right. It's like, I'm just knows? that skillful. And then you move house and you realize that your FPS skills have just really <laughs> right. yeah. shattered. And you're like, it must be my hardware. I'm, I'm and terrible. No. Yeah. <laughs> you're away from the portal. The angel can't read. Uh, right. Or, I mean, because there's, you see it in cinema all the time or even just in like, like older books or stories that there's a yin and a yang. Right? Mm -hmm. There's a balance. Well, traditionally speaking, activating some of the, those religious beliefs a more sinister entity, a devil, as it were, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of other religions, so forgive me for my localized language here, but a, a demon wants to interfere with this plane, wants to soil the souls, if you will, so, like uh, of human beings. Whereas Trying an angel, to tip the scales. Or, yeah, or a positive entity would be hands off. Positive entity does not Ooh. want to interfere, and so that's perhaps why you might see it that way. That's a good counterpoint. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this podcast happening in the year 200. We'd be, we'd be talking about all sorts of, you know, miracles. The unsolved mysteries would be the miracles. I want some modern miracles. Jillian, can we do Miracle Month? <laughs> no. She said no. I'd be very curious. I mean, that would definitely be a topic to consider for this podcast. If there's like, you know, something went down where like, whoa, this kid walked up a wall to save someone. Spider-Man. Where's Spider-Man? 
But yeah, I mean, when it comes to the idea of the portal, the fact that so many people outside the family, including police officers, religious figures, caseworkers, medical staff, etc., all witness something happen to the family does play into the idea that something might have been going on. That, yeah. that something might have been leeching out of a portal or some other plane of existence and actually happening. Zach Bagans claimed that the house had disturbing, extreme paranormal activity, enough for the house to be demolished, a lot of activity centered around that basement. And he actually told Indianapolis Star, the Indy Star, the paper of Indianapolis, that, quote, there was something there that was very dark, yet highly intelligent and powerful. He doesn't come out of a lot of places saying something like that. I mean, yes, it is his profession. He makes money off of it, etc. But he doesn't come out of a lot of places making such a strong claim. But this is a place that he bought. He bought it. He has a documentary. Yeah. That is worth weighing on the scales. And then with regards to the location, Gary, Indiana. It's very north and west of Indiana. Essentially, if you live in Gary, you might as well say you live in Chicago because the burbs of Chicago really bleed over into Indiana. And Gary in particular is part of the dune lands of Indiana, the Indiana Dunes. Just a bunch of sandy hills near Lake Michigan. I've been there. It's a good time. Water's freezing. It's also a protected area along the southern shores of Lake Michigan. Now, some say, the reason I bring this up, some say that this area has high paranormal activity and it's home to many famous ghost stories, including Diana of the Dunes. Diana is said to be a beautiful woman who still roams the dunes after a traumatic death. The story is based on a real person, Alice Mabel Gray. So the demon house was located very close to the dunes before it was torn down, and maybe some of this energy might have leached from the dune area or activity of that area and localized here in this house. And perhaps the paranormal energy of the area could be why a portal popped up and it just happened to be in or at this house for some reason. Interesting. Yeah. Is there a lot of stories of activity in those dunes? Not to my knowledge. This is actually the first I've heard about it outside of Jillian mentioning some stories. Me personally, I haven't heard much about Gary outside of the town itself kind of yeah. falling under decay. Like it yeah. used to be a really big, I think like steel city. There's a lot of cities along the, the Great Lakes that have just kind of decayed over time. Yeah, wow. Cities of the past that, you know, as jobs and manufacturing moved away, they just kind of dilapidated. Yeah. But that's really all I know about Gary, Indiana and that kind of area. Not much paranormal outside of this house. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because you'd think there'd be like a lot going on there if it was popping to the point where it's making a portal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And then the last theory that we take this at face value, that the events at the demon house were genuine hauntings that not only the family experienced, but the people that were around this family experienced, that the house itself was tormented by some level of demonic activity, at least for a splash of time, and was either cleansed properly before being demolished or was just straight up demolished, and that whatever demonic entities might have been there have since scattered. But that's the question. Was something attached to this home? What was it after? Can we properly explain all of the stories that the Ammons family witnessed? You know what I mean? But after leaving the house, the family has no longer experienced anything else. So it seems that nothing has attached itself to them. It seems local to that plot of land. But it and attached themselves when they were living in the house mm -hmm. and left with them to the mm -hmm. hospital, the kids. To the hospital, yeah. But as soon as they moved out, it seemed it was done. So again, it does raise some eyebrows interesting on the timing. Yeah, because if anything, maybe you'd have some residual effects that fade over time. Right? I thought the demons are like, they signed out of their lease. Right. Like, dang it. That's the walls it. are gone. That's the contract. Like, if they're contractually right. obligated to stay in this house, we got them. <laughs> uh, we got them. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I really, you know, this could be, you know, I, there's a balance between the story of a lot of the mysteries we uncover and the curiosities where you just can't describe it. Yeah. This one might be one where the story is super strong and very curious and it really whets my appetite for the unknown but at the end of the day it might just be a simple practical answer that isn't too spooky True. who knows and what this really drives home for me um especially now that we are amateur uh ghost hunters mm -hmm. paranormal hunters. on the way to pro uh, yeah big leagues <laughs> um no matter what happens to us small or big no one will ever believe us no one. No. But we will have our video cameras ready. We will. We're not going to fall. You know, we're not going to do that. 
right? Yeah. There's something happening. Everyone put your phones away. Right. Yeah. It, it, like, uh, I could tell you this, like, we've been creating content uh, for a very long time. And if we were to experience something, it's because we actually experienced it. Exactly. There's, there's That's no, the way we go about it. Yeah. Whether it be discussing these stories or at our ghost hunt next week, when we investigate, the idea is we want to be super open to hearing things, to seeing things, but we also want to be practical. Anything that we can try to debunk without yeah. being malicious and just forcing a debunk or the opposite of that being like, no, everything is factually happening. You right. want to you want to be practical. Can we debunk this? Was this sound from something? Yep. And then whatever is left unexplained, we leave it task force to you to at least see. Yeah. And see what happens, you know, see if you can come up with anything about it. But all right. Well, that's been the Demon House. Strap in task force. We're not done yet. We're not out of the woods, as it were. One more location left. We get hands on. We go around Penhurst Asylum. We investigate. Talk about the stories there. But again, we're so incredibly grateful, Task Force, for all the listens, That's for the five-star reviews, for guys. coming out to support case files when that comes out, like all that stuff. You guys supporting us has enabled us to take this show above and beyond yep. where we expected when we started it. Yep. And we have no plans of stopping. Um, I mean, look, we've said it a handful of times, but now, you know, I could re really stitch it together. We started this during the pandemic not in person, mm -hmm. having no idea where this would go. You guys took it, joined the task force, you signed up, you got your badges, all right? You've been moving offices like crazy because we keep Once you settle down, we make you move again. Deconstructing things. Oh, yeah. And because of that love and support, like, boom, you guys are seeing it. We got Red Web case files, right? We have, uh, you know, different variety of episodes where we go hands-on with some things, go over you guys' theories, et cetera, test things out, get scientific with it all that we're going on ghost hunts this is stuff that's happening just a couple goofballs because the task force absolutely like you guys mess with us mm -hmm. and so like if you're sitting here thinking like oh i just listened to the show like all that counts mm -hmm. all that matters we see you task force thank you again happy halloween enjoy your october be safe out there and we'll see you next week right back here for another mystery